Hello and welcome. If you're new to my channel, my name is Christina. And in today's video, I'm really excited to share four DIY projects with you. As some of you may already know, we are actually packing as we are in a move. So we're finding all kinds of fun little treasures and deciding if we're going to keep it or recycle it over to the new home. And sometimes when you're coming into a new space, you might want to reconfigure and retransform what you may already have. So I'm really excited to share some fun ideas with you. So let's head over to project one. I wanted to redo a dresser I already have, but I didn't have any matte black paint, but I did find chalkboard paint. So I thought I'd give this a try and I wanted to do a whole new makeover to this dresser. This small little dresser used to actually be mirror, but it got broken and I decided I was going to paint it and it's actually just been a canvas play piece for many, many makeovers. So if you're ever gonna do a new makeover over a painted piece that's had a wax or varnish onto it, I suggest using a TSP and that's gonna just remove that top coat. So when you go to put a new coat on, you won't have any peeling you can always use a light grit sandpaper just to give it a little scuff to remove any of the sealant that's actually on your previous painted pieces. So I'm gonna use the foam roller, which is meant for most types of paint, and this chalkboard paint is actually a latex paint. Since we're currently in the middle of packing and I am packing up some of my supplies, it actually was kind of a relief to find some other things that I haven't actually tried before and give them a sample. Because I want this ultra matte finish in this jet black, the chalkboard paint's gonna work just as well, or at least I hope. My initial idea for this particular makeover is actually to give it a little bit of a smoked out effect. So when I get to my next few steps, I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. I do recommend at least two, if not three coats of the chalkboard paint. Pretty critical with the chalkboard paint and being latex is to make sure it's 100% completely dry before you go into your next layer. Now I've never worked with a fine, fine tissue paper and decoupage like this. Usually the papers I've used have a little bit more structure to it. So this is almost like a very fine rice paper. So using the Mod Podge and a disposable sponge, I laid out my drawers so that way they were face up and all together. I also have this other decoupage paper that I thought would be perfect for the sides. You don't need very much Mod Podge, so I usually just pour out a little bit at a time and I make sure I evenly distribute it across my drawers. And because we're gonna be separating these drawers, what I like to do is actually, wherever I'm gonna start, I bring it into the next drawer. Then I'm gonna use an X-Acto knife to cut the decoupage paper and then continue on with the Mod Podge. I also found it very helpful just to work in these small, small sections. That way you can control the paper. Even if you need to lift it back up a little bit, and there is the Mod Podge underneath it, you have a little bit of a flexibility and time to work with it before it starts to grab and adhere. I actually found these decoupage papers as a web link from Zazzle, and I'm gonna leave that in the description box below. There is a huge assortment of all kinds of furniture decoupage and other project decoupage papers with a huge assortment of different styles. I really wanted to grab this piece to look a little bit more that old world, very vintage smoked out look. So I'm thinking using this chalkboard paint or any type of matte finish chalk style paint, it will do the trick. So when I'm laying out the decoupage, again, I'm just gonna do this in the small sections and I'm just going to lightly with my hand. Now, because it's so thin, I hate to use something like a credit card because I have a feeling it's gonna tear. Even just using my hand, it's gonna tear into the corners, but I can fix those. I'm not too worried if it has a few little shreds. The paper I've decided to use on the outside of this dresser, I actually would like to incorporate that into the front decoupage as well. So with a few of those little tears, I think I'm just gonna use those areas to bring the side paper to the front. And I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a moment. 
I also seal the top of the decoupage with Mod Podge. And FYI, if you don't have any chalk paint sealer or clear wax, you can use Mod Podge to seal your chalk paint projects. It's actually very inexpensive and does a fantastic job. When using the X-Acto knife, just go very, very slowly so that way your uh, paper doesn't shred or start to tear into a different direction on you. So again, everything's just a little bit of patience and you'll be good to go. So just for the amount of paper I have left over from the side decoupage papers, I'm going to incorporate those into the front decoupage. So that way it kind of has this continuity that they kind of went together and they weren't two separate sheets and two separate designs. Once the decoupage paper is completely dry from its original Mod Podge application, now because I'm going to put on more of the decoupage papers, I'm going to slightly layer it. Then, because we're going to see those little layers, I'm actually going to paint to camouflage those. So again, when I would use the Mod Podge underneath the decoupage, place the decoupage, I would still put the Mod Podge sealer on top and that way everything was nicely sealed into place. This will also help remove any little air pockets and help smooth out any of the crinkles. I love the crinkles, but also I don't want too many crinkles. So what I want to do is kind of this natural tear so that way this front piece has a natural wear to it. And when I add that paint, which I'll get to in just a moment, you'll see what I mean, just trying to make everything cohesive. Definitely wanna be a little patient with the rice paper decoupages, but they do look beautiful. And I love that thin look, as you're not even really gonna see the paper once we get into some painting. So I've chosen an Enfleur brown chalk paint and the French linen, which is just a light taupe. And very, very lightly, just with the tips of my bristles on my brush, and I like to use a paper towel just to dap it out a little bit, I'm going to apply a very tiny, tiny coat, and I'm going to stipple it on. And I'm just lightly feathering some paint around the corners, a little bit onto the decoupage, just areas that you feel would kind of work in continuity to the actual decoupage image. So you're actually just creating kind of this half painting on top. Once my dark brown was completely dry, I then went and lightly feathered on a little bit of the French linen on top. All I'm doing is just adding those highlights and lowlights to frame out the decoupage. These two colors seem to balance in against the black, and I don't want to take away all the black, but I actually just kind of want to work it in so it matches into the decoupage itself. For this type of painting, always remember, very little paint and dab out your brushes. It's kind of like a dry brush, but maybe just a little bit more paint. I also wanted to lightly dust on just a little hint of paint onto the hardware, which is also a cast iron. So everything from the chalkboard paint, again, even using an ultra matte uh, chalk style paint, you'll get the exact same effect. And I'm just going to smoke it out with just light corners and edges with a little bit of that French linen. I originally painted this a couple of years ago for my spare room and I love it. It's the Spenska blue mixed in with some little bit of everything in the Annie Sloan chalk paint and 
Now I'm going to do a whole different makeover as for the new home that we're going to be going to, I have a whole new design output that I want to do. So for the few pieces of furniture I am going to take, I thought I would have some fun and do a few new makeovers. So I'm going to use the chalkboard paint again, just as my base, and I'm going to try something a little bit different on this old armoire. This is one of those old veneered style armoires probably from the 1940s, maybe the 50s. And it's all painted with Arles, which is a really creamy, fun yellow all onto the inside. Now, the only thing is, is that hardware is actually glued on, so I can't take it off. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna paint it all black and then we're gonna highlight it up again. It's always fun to restyle, recreate with your own pieces of furniture you already have, whether it's because you're moving or you want to put it into a different room and you want to have a whole different design aspect for your piece. Painting over furniture is so easy. Again, you can use the TSP or you could even just lightly sand a little bit if it has a sealer or a clear wax or wax finish. That way, your paint will adhere and it won't peel. So for this one, I wanna use the IOD decor transfers. One of my favorite, the Prim and Trim. These come in strips. It comes in one sheet, but you can cut it into strips. Now I have plenty of leftover from a few previous projects that I've done. So I'm gonna to have to work with the amount that I actually have. And if I had my way, I wish I actually had another one of these, so that way I could wrap it all the way around. With the remaining pieces of this prim and trim transfer, I should be able to cut out a design for this piece that's going to work. And also I will leave a link for the IOD transfer in my description box below. Transfers are very easy. They give you a applicator, which is a, just a small thin stick, and you're just gonna basically rub it on. Like I mentioned, if I had it, I wish the transfers would actually go all the way, but they've already been cut. So I'm just using up what I have to figure out what I could do to make a style onto here and make it cohesive. For the doors, to make sure that they're opening and closing and not rubbing on the transfers, I've actually just cut it as it starts to turn. Then I went into that center column and then I continued on. So just with an X-Acto knife, you can cut it and align it exactly how you need. Now, because some of the transfer couldn't go all the way to the edge, I'm actually gonna incorporate a very similar kind of fun little design with primer red, a Enfleur chocolate brown, and again, a little bit of that French linen for some highlights. And generally what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of hiding that there's a transfer and I'm kind of just working it into the design of creating an old kind of old world look. So I'm just stippling taking that paintbrush, just dabbing onto the paint, and a little goes a long way. The less paint you use, the more and easier it is to blend it in together. I find it super helpful to make sure that the paintbrush that I'm gonna use is not only moist, not soaking wet, but moist, and it's always a little bit helpful to have a little bit of a spray water bottle on hand. So if you're working in a warmer climate, you can at least keep your paint a little bit moist. And this way you can just keep stippling it together. It's a stabbing motion. You're just gonna kind of lightly stab it and you're gonna work those colors in how you want your design. So if you want your low lights in one spot and your highlights in another spot, I'm also gonna run some of the paint across the transfer in random. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of that primer red just a little bit, and sometimes even with my finger, I'll run the paint down a little bit onto the transfer. For the hardware, because I have this back plate that comes with it, and that's what's actually glued onto the door, I'm just going to lightly, lightly dry brush with a little bit of that French linen, and I'm also going to lightly dry brush all the way around my transfers. And it's what it's gonna do is it's just going to pick up any high points on the texture of the paint. To seal your project, you can use a varnish in the clear mat with a roller.
a super easy beginner patchwork blanket. You do not have to be any kind of crochet or knitter to do this. It is so easy and especially if you're a busy person but you'd like to make something. I want to show you how easy it is to make patches of squares and you can make as many as you want. You can make it as big as you want. But for this one I made 50 squares in random with leftover chenille yarn that I had. So all of the product of what I've used will be in the description box below. But because of previous projects, I had these random ones left over, so I just wanted to use them up. First thing I'm going to do is make a slip knot, and I'm going to use a 10 millimeter crochet hook. All you're going to do is make one chain of 10. So you're just going to wrap into your working yarn and pull through the loop to make a chain of 10. First thing you're going to do is add a stitch at the end of your chain. The reason is, is because you're going to go into the second stitch. You'll have two loops on your crochet hook. Grab the working yarn, pull it all the way through. We're going to do that again. Go into your chain with your crochet. You have one loop on your crochet hook. Now you have two. Grab your working yarn, pull it through once. Then you're going to pull it through again back down to one loop on your crochet hook. This is simple, basic, single crochet. It's really easy. It's just repetitive. This is the only thing you need to know to make your squares. You're going to stitch all the way to that first slip knot you started with your chain. Flip your work over. Don't forget to add one stitch. That's actually your first stitch. That's why you're going to go into the second bump of stitches there. Now, now that you've made your first row of crochet, you're going to notice that the very top actually has two bumps. That's where the braid is. It's two bumps at the top there. Those two bumps, where I'm going to stick my finger in, that's actually going to be one stitch for you. So that's going to be how you're going to make these squares. You're actually going to stick your crochet hook in those two bumps. That counts as one. And you're going to do the exact same thing I just showed. So don't think of it as two separate stitches, think of that bump at the top as one. This is just the simple formula of how simple crochet works. So that end stitch that you keep adding is actually your first stitch, then you go into the second stitch from that point. That's the only thing that is the trick part of making a simple crochet. Once you have that, the rest of this is easy, it's just repetition. So we're going to build a square starting with 10 stitches and I'm going to do 10 rows up. Each square can take you about 10-15 minutes. Once you're done your square, you've made your 10 rows, just cut off before you add anything else, just cut off from your last stitch there, take your working yarn, cut it off, and just pull it through and now you've made a knot. You can make a second knot if you just want to add a little bit more security. You also may have a little tail from when you first started your square. So again, just make a knot and cut it off. Now, once you have all the squares for your blanket, like I mentioned, I made 50 squares in random to whatever I had left over. Now I have a little bit thinner of a chenille yarn and with a smaller crochet hook, you don't have to use a smaller crochet hook, but I'm going to, I'm going to show you how to make a slip stitch to attach all of your squares together. Because the yarn I've used is so bulky, it actually kind of bows a little bit, but it's all part of the charm. So what I did is six squares across and then I made eight squares in length. So for this, as a new person who's never done any slip stitch before, you can always use a really good embroidery thread and a needle and stitch them together. But I'm just showing you here by grabbing the squares, I'm actually kind of starting it off like a crochet and I'm going to go into every single stitch side by side, grab my working yarn, pull it through two, and that loop that's on my crochet hook, I pull it through. Go into my next stitch, grab my working yarn, pull it through, pull it through, that's it. You're just, it's a slip stitch. So I'm stitching it on versus with a needle, I'm using a crochet hook. So instead of pulling the yarn over 
the actual squares, I'm pulling it through the stitch, as you can see. So again, and when you're ready to add another square, you just keep going. Just grab that end corner stitch, pull it through, and repeat. absolutely love the sheepy yarn. It is so soft and beautiful, but I don't have enough to create this blanket. So what I'm going to do is actually pull them together. I'm going to use a 16 millimeter crochet hook and I'm just starting my chain. But to make this as easy as possible, I'm just going to do a chain of 10 and show you exactly what I did to create this blanket. This is such an easy throw to create for any style or any decor. Super soft. It is absolutely easy to wash and throw in the dryer. So once I've made my chain, it just looks like a braid. And again, using any single simple crochet, you're going to add a stitch at the end. Going into your chain, you're going to go into that second stitch as you reverse back. Then you're going to do your simple crochet. So you'll have one loop on your crochet hook, go into your stitch, loop once, loop twice. Now you're going to go into your next stitch, side by side. Loop once, loop twice, go into your next stitch. Always remember that slip knot when you make your chain is a stitch. Once you actually stitch that, don't forget any crochet you're always going to add a stitch when you turn your work over you're going to add that stitch you can do it before you turn it over or when you've already turned it over that is actually your first stitch that's why you're going to take your crochet hook and go into that second stitch as you start to go back we're doing the same thing again you're going to feel those two little bumps at the top there they're two that's because you've already done a row of the crochet but it only counts as one so you're going to go ahead and continue on with your crochet. So you'll feel it even with this yarn, any yarn you use, you're going to see those two bumps at the top. You're going to count that as only one stitch. Once you have those basic rules down, you're good to go. If you're new to any type of crocheting, I do recommend to try a small little square sample. That way you can see that you're getting the whole routine of it. You'll notice that as you start to build up your rows, that end stitch is always going to be a little bit on the side and I just I've made these mistakes before because it's hard to catch when you first start to learn if it's not caught it's not going to be nice and straight on both sides so again you've added a stitch you're going into that second loop there because you've already created a stitch with the added stitch it's just the way the crochet pattern works as you can see that side it's a little bit slanted. You want to make sure you're picking up that stitch. And again, this is just making your crochet pattern nice and straight on the sides for your blanket. Once you have those few basic rules, this whole blanket is super easy. The only trick with trading a different textured yarn is before you make your extra stitch, because we're going to flip the work over, I'm actually, before I make that extra stitch, this is the only time that I switch out my yarn. I cut off what I'm using, I add my new textured yarn. This way, every time I'm going to swap it out as I continue on with the pattern, that actual new yarn plus the original yarn I'm using will always have a continuity to it. So now I'm going to add my stitch, then I'm going to flip my work over, start into that second stitch and move back and now I'm starting in with this sheepy yarn and this sheepy yarn is so soft I absolutely love it but you have to feel where your stitches are it's so fluffy you're not really going to see the holes of the stitch so you're going to have to just run your finger and you you will feel it the simple pattern for this entire blanket was eight rows of the cream chenille then when I used the sheepy yarn and attached that, I would do four rows of that and I kept repeating. 
With the sheepy blanket, I went around the entire border of the whole blanket. You will feel each stitch loop and I made six rows all the way around for a border. Now I'm just showing you how I did a pom-pom. So starting with a slip stitch, you're going to go into the same stitch. That's it. So I'm going to grab some working yarn, get started just like I would with starting a whole new crochet pattern. I'm going to go back into the same stitch again, turn my crochet. Now I have two loops on my crochet, grab my working yarn, pull it through. I'm going to repeat that seven times into the same stitch. All it's going to do is bulk up the yarn and make a nice little round pom-pom. Once I cut it, I then take my last little stitch on my crochet hook, pull that last little bit of working yarn through there, make a nice little knot, grab the tail I started with from my slip knot, pull them together, tie them tightly, you can even do two, and cut off the end. Simple crochet, a simple little pom-pom, and two different textured yarns. Voila! It's pretty easy and it makes for beautiful home decor or gifts. Thank you so much for watching today's video and please if you have any questions and or comments leave me a comment in the comment box below. If you haven't already hit the subscribe button and notification bell. It's going to tell you when I upload my next video. I'm really excited to be sharing a whole new series coming soon and some DIY Wednesdays so I'll be uploading another video per week. So for now take care and I'm really looking forward to seeing you soon.